So I'm Christy McAlpine, as John said. I'm a stroke consultant and geriatrician in Glasgow Royal, and I'm also the lead clinician for the Stroke Managed Clinical Network. And pain after stroke, I think, is an important thing for us. I've been involved in one or two different things around um, documents, best practice statements, also writing a, I don't know if any of you have ever looked at the STARS educational modules online for stroke, and we've recently done one of them about pain. And it is, it's an important thing for patients. So the topics I'm going to cover tonight are essentially those three, um, which are the main stroke-related pain issues that we see, and headache, shoulder pain, and finally central post-stroke pain. So the first question I think is, how common is pain after stroke? And there are one or two studies have tried to look at this epidemiologically. Obviously, pain, as you know, is quite common in the population in general. But probably about 40% of people who've had a stroke report new stroke-related pain. I have to say, actually, just in case you wonder, it's kind of slightly jargony. Stroke survivors is the kind of recommended way to talk about people who've had a stroke now. And the stroke charity is quite like that as a phrase. So um, that's why we talk about stroke survivors. So about 40% of people have new stroke-related pain. And people have done other studies seeing you know, things like analgesia intake as some kind of surrogate for numbers. And they think that about 15% of stroke survivors take some form of analgesia at least daily, which I think is quite a lot. Uh, I know, obviously, analgesia intake is high generally. And what are the consequences of post-stroke pain? I mean, again, similar to other causes of pain, but particularly reduces quality of life. It complicates rehabilitation. One of the challenges we have is that people, when they have pain of some kind, are quite focused on it often. So if you're trying to do rehabilitation, which often involves moving people around, looking at regaining mobility, other movement, they're often not particularly keen to do that because they think it might make the pain worse or bring the pain on. And it undoubtedly reduces people's willingness to participate in rehabilitation. It disturbs sleep, which is a significant thing, affects mood and social functioning. And there's also some evidence that it increases long-term mortality. Now that may be possibly because of the effects it has on people's global functioning. But a lot of this is talking about people in the longer term. Obviously some of this will be in the initial period when people are in hospital after their stroke. But this is a kind of longer term problem. So it's big quality of life issues. First thing to talk about is headache, which is very common after strokes. I suspect probably it's even commoner. I mean, the, the quoted prevalence is 25 to 60%. I suspect it's probably even commoner than that because people don't necessarily mention it because they're more worried about the fact that they can't speak properly or their left leg doesn't move anymore. The headache's not necessarily right up there with what they want to, to tell you about. It's quite interesting, though, I think, to remember that it's quite common also after TIA. So people who appear to have completely recovered from whatever had happened may complain of ongoing headache. And they, I think, are more likely to complain because they're quite concerned about what is going on inside their head. It's commoner in posterior stroke, which is probably just some kind of pressure effect. That If you have a posterior stroke, you pr there's more likelihood of some effect on your intracranial pressure. And it's probably in about a third of people with an ischemic stroke and more common in hemorrhagic stroke. But it's not really a way that you can tell one or the other. It just happens to be more common in hemorrhagic. Just a few things about characteristics of it, that it's often on the same side as the stroke lesion, but it's not always. And I think you might think from first principles that if you had, say, a right frontal infarct, you'd expect you might have a right-sided headache, but you don't necessarily. It seems to be commoner in younger people, commoner in women, and it's often associated with people who have a history of migraine. There's quite a lot of discussion about the association between strokes and migraine, and is stroke more common in people with migraine than it probably is, and why should that be, and what the physiology might be behind that. But certainly, if you have a patient who already had migraine and then they have a stroke or a TIA, they are likely either to complain of new headaches or their migraine being worse than it was before. 
The severity of the headache's not related to the size of the lesion either, which is also another slightly odd thing. I was quite like, I always regard medicine a bit as kind of applied physiology. That was my way trying to work my way around things. But a lot of these things don't quite work. So you can have a tiny stroke and quite severe headaches and a big stroke and no headache. And there's no association between headache and outcome. It makes no difference at all. We used to see a lot of people who had post-stroke headaches because they were in persantin retard, as it was called. Um, and now that we don't really use that, apart from if we have no way of giving anyone any antiplatelets any other way, we don't really see that. Um, so that's helpful. Essentially, the treatment of post-stroke headaches is reassure people, because I think patients do often think is this a recurrence? Is it complications? As I said earlier, I think if people have a severe stroke, they're thinking about other things. But people who have minor strokes or TIAs and then get headaches are often really quite worried about what this means. And generally just simple analgesia, paracetamol or codeine is fine and is usually effective. Second thing I was going to talk about was shoulder pain. And shoulder pain is a big issue for hemiplegic people. Probably about 80% of stroke survivors who have a persisting hemiplegia have some kind of problem with shoulder pain. And I'm sure it's something that you have people in complaining about and having concerns about. And it's undoubtedly one that hampers functional recovery and is associated with ongoing disability. Largely because, again, it's back to the people think it's sore, they're trying to protect their shoulder, they won't move properly, and... Therapy, therapy after stroke is very reliant on stroke patients' understanding of what you want to do and be able to work with you. And similarly, in longer term problems, if people have a painful shoulder, they don't use it so it gets more stiff and it all gets worse. Sometimes shoulder pain can begin early in stroke. Generally, would two to three months after stroke is a common time for starting to notice more problems and preventing is a key goal for stroke services. We do quite a lot of things with working, for example, with hospital staff about how to move stroke patients. We, we, we're at all possible. We do some training even with porters. So if people are moving patients around, going to x-ray or something, they know how to move them without hopefully affecting their shoulders. There are th three sort of common types. One is just the kind of frozen shoulder, a bit like you get for other reasons. And that is probably due to the fact that the hemiplegic arm is not supporting the shoulder, the arm muscles are not supporting it, and essentially the shoulder capsule is stretched and there's damage and inflammation um, from that. Subluxation of the shoulder joint, I realise my pointer battery run out, so I have no way of pointing out there, can't see one, anyway. Um, essentially, subluxation of the shoulder joint is partial dislocation of the shoulder, and that will be due to loss of muscle power and tone in the arms. And that is another thing around the area of correct positioning and transferring of stroke patients. And that, again, is important lifelong. If people have persisting hemiplegia, it's very important that anyone assisting them. So there's an issue again for us in things like home care. People should be shown how to transfer a patient to try to protect their shoulder from further problems. Because the problem is that once that shoulder has subluxed, unless there's significant improvement in the arm function, it won't repair itself. So the patient is then left with a chronically painful joint. Obviously, if it happens early and the patient then gets good recovery of function in the arm, then it will resolved to a large extent, but you do see, not infrequently see patients who are left with chronically painful shoulders. Spasticity of the arm, um, essentially that is increased muscle tone and then you're getting flexion of the arm joints. And that's really a sort of key goal for modern stroke rehabilitation is to avoid that. And certainly I remember when I was young, you'd often see people who'd had obviously moderately significant strokes and their arms were completely flexed up and then their fingers would come round and their nails were digging into their palms and all these other things. And we rarely see that now and hopefully you don't see it. Um, but a key goal of stroke rehab is to avoid that happening. 
It's challenging in patients who have severe strokes and are unaware that they have, you know, their affected side exists, if they've got a loss of neglect of their affected side, or if the patients have significant cognitive impairment, and you do sometimes see it now in, say, nursing home patients who have a stroke, and it's not really feasible to rehabilitate them because they have background dementia and they don't understand, so you will see flexion with them, and it often is really quite painful. Initial management of the specificity problem is simple analgesia. Or I'm taking that back. This one is shoulder pain. It's simple analgesia, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. If the patient has capsulitis, then it's worth considering steroid injections, which will sometimes help. If the patient has ongoing problems, particularly specificity related, it's worth thinking about specialist medical referral. And within GGC, there's a specificity clinic that Dr. Niall Hughes runs with Jill Alexander, who's our stroke HP consultant. They run that in the Southern, generally a bit overcommitted, it's constantly just about on the wire for uh, referrals. So we're trying to increase capacity. One of our goals for next year for the new Southern, when everything's going to be absolutely wonderful, um, is to try to have another specificity clinic session because it's a very specialist thing and is excellent for patients who have that particular kind of problem. And they use botulinum toxin for injections into spastic muscles. Baclofen, I don't think it's as specialist as, as the specificity clinic. Baclofen probably is the kind of thing that the stroke clinics are talking about. There are pros and cons of baclofen, but certainly if someone has high muscle tone, as it's used in other neurological conditions, baclofen may help if the pain's due to high tone. There are people who are very keen on TENS machines or FEZ. I don't think anyone in GGC is using FEZ as far as I know, but there are some studies suggesting that TENS machines might be helpful for these patients um, if they're problematic shoulder pain. So I think, well, I was interested here, we don't refer many people to the pain clinic. I actually thought we did refer some, but maybe I could be referring more. Um, so a lot of these things are more specialist. I think the key thing is to make sure that there is physiotherapy input. You want to minimise the risk of shoulder pain starting in the first place, but also treating it when it's present. Sometimes patients want to put their arm in a sling, which is generally not a good idea. I think the general feeling from the physios is they're not terribly keen in slings now. Some people use strapping for people with low tone arms, but a kind of variable success. But I think what you want is a physiotherapist with stroke knowledge. Um, and certainly from the point of view of GGC patients, patients can be referred back to community stroke team for review whenever after the stroke. There's also input from day hostels and so on and community physios. But if it's something where you think you need somebody that has stroke knowledge, community stroke team is generally the best bet. Ongoing shoulder pain usually has a poor outcome. And that's again, I think, because function's a bit less good than the patient had hoped, mood's low. So I think if you have patients who seem to be struggling even two or three years after a stroke, as I said, it's also worth, it's worth considering referral back for rehab review. The third of my three topics is central post-stroke pain, which used to be called thalamic syndrome and then got renamed. Um, I think it was first identified in 1908 by Rosowski, I think. Um, and essentially it's neuropathic pain and it's probably the one that we definitely do sometimes refer to the pain clinic. And basically stroke damaging somewhere in the spinal thalamocortical pathway and about 10% of stroke survivors will at some point get central post-stroke pain. And it's also one that not infrequently starts very late. So you might have somebody who had their stroke 18 months ago and presents now saying, I've got this terrible pain that's just started my arm. And because of that, you quite often find that people have quite a lot of different investigations done sometimes before somebody says, actually, I think this is all due to a stroke also confounded by the fact that it may be a stroke where people have relatively few other physical disabilities. So they look as if they made a good recovery from their stroke and then this happens. And the key thing is that they have this disturbance of processing of sensory information. So the patient perceives things like, you know, the kind of breeze blowing on their arm, 
they find very painful. And of course, their family often think this is very weird, part of anything else. Um, temperature changes, touch, everything is pain. And sometimes it can occur spontaneously, mild to severe in nature. It's a, a, quite a strange thing altogether. Sometimes the patient will say it's there all the time. It's completely dominating their life. They cannot get away from this terrible pain. This is just a wee case history, just of a kind of typical kind of person. It's a 54-year-old man, mild left hemi with some loss of sensation, and he did have a right thalamic infarct, and then started complaining of this strange kind of feeling that something was spreading over this left hemiparetic area as if he was wearing some kind of armour that was too tight. So that's a fairly typical, although early onset, but it's not a typical story. And said it was pressing, tight, burning, very severe, couldn't stand for long, couldn't do cooking and shopping, socially isolated, couldn't sleep, and was seen by us and saying he was considering suicide, just couldn't cope with this pain. It, and that's where some people get to. And people describe it as shooting, cramping, burning, numbness, stabbing, pins and needles. It all sounds fairly unpleasant, I think, altogether. But the, the jet, I think one of the characteristic things about this pain is that people say it's unpleasant. It's not just sore, it's obviously all pain to some degree is unpleasant. But it's not just the kind of sore because you've broken your arm and it's sore. It's an unpleasant pain. That's just to remind you, probably familiar with all these things, but the kind of descriptive terms that tend to be used for central pain of allodynia, which pain due to stimulus that doesn't usually cause pain, which is another key thing for this. It's these strange things like touch or temperature causing pain, dysesthesia, which is an abnormal sense of touch, or hyperalgesia, just the extreme reaction to stimulus. For central post pain, simple analgesia is not usually effective. Generally, people often try, and generally I think patients will, if something's sore, they'll go and try taking paracetamol or brufen or something, whatever they have in the house. Um, simple analgesia is rarely effective in central post pain. Amitriptyline is quite often quite helpful, um, although patients sometimes have don't want to take things like amitriptyline, don't want to take antidepressants, anti-epileptic drugs, and again, similar to what you might be thinking of for neuropathic pain. So, lamotrigine, carbamazepine, gabapentin. Some people have resorted to surgical treatment, and there are some studies suggesting that spinal cord stimulation or deep brain stimulation can be helpful for these people. And certainly, again, these kind of people, I think, have got to generally pain clinic level or other specialist clinic level. Um, but they, sometimes this can go on for a long time of people trying to resolve this. It's certainly also worth thinking about psychology referral for people with this kind of pain. In Glasgow and Clyde, and hopefully some of you have encountered the service, we have a stroke psychology service, which we're very fortunate to have. We're the only board in Scotland that has a stroke psychology service that's for the stroke service and covers all of GGC. And certainly if the patient's really struggling with the pain and there's a lot of stuff around mood and how they're coping, it's worth thinking about referral to psychology. And again, sometimes that's done obviously through the pain clinics. Referring to the pain clinics, and I, say, I think it's the central pain patients are the ones that I certainly have occasionally referred to the pain clinic. The long-term outcome, again, is often quite poor that if people don't get something that resolves the pain, it, it just dominates their life. And then it becomes a problem for the family and everyone else who is associated with the patient. So again, it's another one of poor long-term outcome. So just to summarise my wee things, that pain is common. Common problem after stroke, say probably about 40% of people most of the things it's worth trying simple analgesia first of all because often that will resolve things. Consider referral to rehabilitation services either physiotherapy locally or back to community stroke team or something like that even long term after stroke and also stroke psychology service may be able to help so again if it's a patient that's struggling it's always worth considering that. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs>